A large van was hijacked by a man and a girl. They were later joined by another man. The driver, John Scullion, was ordered to park beside the Europa Hotel. The people inside were given 15 minutes to get out. Forty-five minutes passed, then the bomb went off. Bill and I came in 1995, uh, and I was just remembering, you know, we stayed at the Europa Hotel here in Belfast. It is the most bombed hotel in the world. And Bill said, you know what, if we're going to ask people to take risks for peace, if we're going to ask people to give up their, you know, ideas about what they should get and make a compromise, we have to show that we're willing to connect to them and, and make a stand ourselves. So we saw firsthand that this was going to be an arduous undertaking. So although it's a short period of time in history, a couple of years really, that led to the Good Friday Agreement, it happened in large part because the people of Northern Ireland wanted it. They finally had had enough and they said, we've got to do better than this. Everyone was prepared to take risks and then the people who could affect it most deeply were prepared to carry on working at it. You've got leaders who are prepared to think differently. Ireland was a changing country. There was a different feeling, zeitgeist, if you like. And it, yeah, it came together. Um, and then we had people from the outside, in this case, uh, uh, President Clinton, who, who had both the intelligence to understand the issue and, and the application to, to work at it. And yet, with everybody working together, uh, you describe, you've described how this came together at the last second. It was crazy. Yeah, we were we were literally locked up in this uh, not very nice building for days. George Mitchell was smart on that one. Get him in. A, in a, I've, I've yeah. heard about this building. Uh, Jerry Adams actually said it was not a very good place to negotiate. It was a horrible place to yeah. negotiate. It was absolutely horrible. There weren't any proper facilities. The building was not conducive at all. Um, and then as the days went on, because originally I was supposed to come, we'd do the agreement, and when I got to Northern Ireland, the whole thing had collapsed effectively, because no one, there was no agreement. Mm -hmm. So we, we had to do a lot of days of redrafting, and, and you know, I, I must have had about six hours sleep in, in all of the three days. But it, as, as the thing went on, then it just, it became almost a pressure on everyone, because you thought, you cannot go out afterwards and say, okay, I'm afraid there's nothing. Right. <laughs> so, so there was a, a huge pressure on the people inside the building. I believe that today, courage has triumphed. I said when I arrived here on Wednesday night that I felt the hand of history upon us. Today, I hope that the burden of history can at long last start to be lifted from our shoulders. The people got out ahead of the politicians. They were sick and tired of people dying. They were tired of worrying about their kids walking down the street at night. Like when the Good Friday Accord was put up for a vote, it passed by 94% in, in Ireland, but also by 71% in Northern Ireland. Mm. And it showed you that the people got out ahead of the politicians in a way and gave them the courage to do what had to be done. The parties have made brave decisions. They have chosen hope over hate, the promise of the future over the poison of the past. And in so doing, already they have written a new chapter in the rich history of their island. You had said that the Good Friday Agreement was more of an agreement, that it was very complex, that it was more of an agreement to go on a journey together than it was to reach a destination. I don't think the agreement is so complex. You know, you, you can't understand anything about this place unless you can see it clearly in the context of the British colonization of Ireland. People were denied basic rights. So part of the agreement deals with rights. Uh, you're right, it isn't a destination. It's an agreement to a journey without agreement on the destination so people can decide, which I think is a huge breakthrough, whether they want to live in United Ireland or with the Union. And we, di we didn't have that mechanism until the Good Friday Agreement talks. It's, it's much better, despite the 
frustration some people might have. It's much better than it was uh, before we had the agreement. These days, British troops in Northern Ireland's rural border areas are being attacked more often by the Irish Republican Army. It's felt this is happening because the British soldiers have been beating the IRA badly in the cities and towns, thus forcing the terrorists out into the countryside near their hideouts in Southern Ireland. In general, the soldiers' work has bolstered public confidence. This has helped pave the way for political developments that raise hopes for peace after four years of bloodshed. What does this mean 25 years later to you personally and also to Northern Ireland? It was a great moment for American diplomacy and leadership to help you know, end a conflict that took 3,700 lives, one after another for so many years. And the, you know, the damage and the distrust and the division was so deep. Um, and to see what consistent diplomacy can actually produce when people who have very different opposing ideas about what they want for their own future will take risks to compromise, to get to peace. The chance to live in peace. The chance to raise children out of the shadow of fear. Today is about the promise of a bright future, a day when we hope a line can be drawn under the bloody past. Uh, I think Northern Ireland's a peaceful place. We've got huge support from the United States, uh, you know, a lot of support from the European Union, and it's made a huge, huge difference to this place. The place is going well, you know, a lot of investment. It, it can be far better, far better if, they, if we can just move to the next stage. I don't think we should be fueled by hatred. Hatred is a poison, and we should eradicate that from our thoughts and from our hearts. and go forward on the basis that every human being has the right to dignity and respect and treat people the way you'd want to be treated yourself. So how difficult was it for you to talk to members of your party, to talk to the British public, I guess to talk to the royal family and say, we're going to sit down with Sinn Féin, we're going to sit down with Cherry Adams, we're going to sit down also with people who were responsible for the killing of people that you knew and loved. It was very difficult because you, you, I, I sat with people, the families of those that were killed in the terrorism, and what do you say to them? They say, you're, you're sitting down with, with my, a murderer. Yeah, with yeah. my child's murderer, yeah. and you, you're shaking hands with them. And in the end, it's, it's strange, an interesting thing about human nature, they divide it into two categories, the people who just couldn't forgive you for it, and the people who said, okay, I understand and provided you can tell me that if you get this agreement, then someone's not gonna suffer like I have suffered, so I, their child is not gonna die like my child died, then you do it. The appearance of eight-year-old Catherine Hamill, whose innocent welcome to the president turned sad when she spoke of the death of her father, murdered in their home when she was six months old in her mother's arms, losing a father in the war of Catholics versus Protestants. My first daddy died in the troubles. It was the saddest day of my life. I still think of him. Now it is nice and peaceful. I like having peace and quiet for a change, instead of people shooting and killing. My, my Christmas wish is that peace and love will last in Ireland forever. When they talk here about the troubles, it's often capitalized, a vivid and recent memory. The president tried today to capitalize on this visit to further the peace, promoting a new era and promising Ireland a partner. If you enter that era determined to build a new age of peace, the United States of America will proudly stand with you. Mm. Tell you what, it, it, just an extraordinary peace still, extraordinary leadership, extraordinary courage by the Irish politicians, British politicians, uh, and of course by President Clinton and uh, Hillary Clinton, who, of course, not only was a, went on to be a senator and secretary of state, but she is also the first woman to be the chancellor of Queen's University in Belfast. And right after I, I interviewed President Clinton, as he was leaving, uh, the secretary of state was coming in, and, and one of the president's staff members said, Mr. President, the chancellor. I had a big laugh, and uh, it was uh, just uh, an, an ex extraordinary peace uh, deal 
uh, to celebrate. So